if I lie to the DMV, I'm, I've committed a crime. You're not allowed to send fake documents to the government. That's a crime. And that's exactly what he's doing. He paid lawyers to round up a bunch of idiots, have them sign documents that says we are the electors and we vote for Donald Trump in Georgia, even though he lost in Georgia. And then they took those documents to the governor. They took those uh, documents to the Senate. They took it to the House of Representatives and they tried like hell to give it to the vice president. Fake documents. That is why he's on trial. Not because we don't like him. Not because we think his hair looks stupid. I mean, my hair looks stupid, but that's why he's on trial. Breaking laws, fraudulent documents. Don't let the Republicans gaslight you. Don't let them trick you. Oh, hi. Hello. How are you doing? My name is Waldo, and I am here to feel the politics with you. How's everybody doing tonight? So what I've got for you is one nice, cool, long story tonight to talk about. And that is Jack Smith's latest law bombshell. The cool guy let out some information that just got released to the public. I've got 165 pages of nail biting, exciting law stuff to talk about. I'm only gonna look at the first half. The second half is a little boring. I've read through all of it and looked at it. We'll talk about it. We'll think about what's going on. You can tell me what you think. We can come up with uh, wild scenarios. Wild scenarios? Yeah, if you create a wild scenario, by all means, put it into chat and tell me about it. Hello, human. It is me, Kanooch. I need you to press the subscribe button. I have to feed my many AI babies. Jack Smith, the guy who's going after uh, Donald Trump on the election interference charges, had a lot of his evidence made public yesterday. Jack Smith has rewritten all of his previous work and rewritten all the evidence, rewritten the, the uh, arguments and the discussions because of the Supreme Court's immunity decision. Jack Smith brought to charges against Donald Trump. The Supreme Court said, hey, wait a minute, he's immune for official acts. They didn't really describe what official acts are. They kind of left it vague so that they get to decide because that's what they want. They want that power. They want that authority. The Supreme Court does. So then Jack Smith rewrote all of his work. He already had all the evidence. All he had to do was restructure it, rewrite it, and leave out the bits that were officially uh, part of his job. What we've got now, what was just released yesterday, is 165 pages, which are basically just his opening argument for whether why we should prosecute Donald Trump and why he did crimes against the government. All that fun stuff. So I've got my notes. I, we're not going to read through all of it. But I've got notes on, on the important bits. I read through it myself and then I looked at it. We're not going to read all of it. I'll uh, highlight the important bits, tell you the notes that I wrote down, stuff like that. Let's just jump into it. The vice president debate was watched by 40 million people. And I was going to talk about that today and the fallout and the polls and the best parts and the worst parts and the highlights and all that fun stuff. But it ha I think it's been overshadowed by this Jack Smith case. Uh, so the most important thing to take away from the debate that happened a couple of nights ago was that Vance tried to rewrite history. Uh, I said it live when he was discussing the Jan 6 insurrection attempt that he was revising history. Uh, his attempt to soften the actions of Donald Trump are shot in the ass today by Jack Smith and his unsealing of the documents. Uh, this is basically a 165 page opening argument. So if you look at here, let's read the first couple of pages. The government's motion for immunity determinations. The defendant asserts that he is immune from prosecution for this his criminal scheme to overturn the 2020 president's election because he claims it enti entailed official conduct. Not so. Very strong not so. Although the defendant was the incumbent president during the charged conspiracies, his scheme was fundamentally a private one. Working with a team of private co-conspirators, the defendant acted as a candidate when he pursued multiple criminal means to disrupt through fraud and deceit. Deceit. That's the important question. The government functions by which votes are collected and counted. So anytime it says defendant, that means Donald Trump. The defendant is Donald Trump. Just so everybody knows, we're all on the same page. It will refer to him as the defendant for the next 165 pages. In Trump versus United States, that's a Supreme Court case. The Supreme Court held that the presidents are immune from prosecutions for certain official conduct, including the defendant's use of the Justice Department in furtherance of his scheme, as was alleged in the original indictment, and remanded to this court to determine whether the remaining allegations against the defendant are immunized. The answer to that question is no. 
This motion provides a comprehensive account of the defendant's private criminal conduct, sets forth the legal framework created by Trump for resolving immunity claims, applies that framework to establish that none of the defendant's charged conduct is immunized because it, it either was unofficial or any presumptive immunity is rebutted and requests the relief the government seeks, which is at the bottom of this, that the court determined that the defendant must stay in trial for his private crimes as would any other citizen. So that's the first swing Jack, Jack Smith is taking. The defendant must stand trial for his private crimes as would any other citizen. Yeah, right here. Factual proffer. This is the facts that the uh, Jack Smith is offering to the court. When the defendant lost the 2020 presidential election, bam, slam, right there, when the defendant lost the 2020 presidential election, he resorted to crimes to try to stay in office. <laughs> Doing crimes to stay in office is a crime. With private co-conspirators, the defendant launched a series of increasingly desperate plans to overturn the legitimate election results in seven states that he had lost. Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, the targeted states. His efforts included trying lying to state officials in order to induce them to in ignore true vote counts. So he lied to them to try and get them to accept false vote counts manufacturing fraudulent electoral votes in the targeted states, attempting to enlist Vice President Michael R. Pence in his role as President of the Senate to obstruct Congress's certification of the election by using the defendant's fraudulent electoral votes. And when all else failed on January 6, 2021, I've heard of that, directing an angry crowd of supporters to the United States Capitol to obstruct the congressional certification. The through line of these efforts was deceit. The defendant and co-conspirators knowingly false claims of election fraud they use these lies in furtherance of three conspiracies. Number one, a conspiracy to interfere with the federal government function. Number two, a conspiracy to obstruct official proceedings. And number three, a conspiracy against the rights of millions of Americans to vote and have their votes counted. So I can't highlight on this page and the font changed. This is a conspiracy, folks. So the conspiracy uh, against the rights of millions of Americans to vote and have their votes counted. By doing this thing, he, they have taken away your rights to vote and have your vote counted. Uh, so from here on, uh, CC, a lot of this is redacted, even though we can pretty much figure out who it is. There's a reason for it. The CC means co-conspirator. So co-conspirator one, two, three, four, five. And P is for a uh, person, just a person who is not at the moment charged with a crime. They could be later. Some of these P's who have been redacted might have actually co uh, committed crimes and, and they might face uh, uh, charges later, but we wait for that. Uh, CC number one is definitely Rudy Giuliani. We definitely know it's him. It's not hard to figure out. When you listen to the things that CC one said, you're like, oh, well, I, I saw Rudy Giuliani say that on CNN. Why is it redacted on this document? Because this document is about Donald Trump, not the other people. This is highlighting and pointing out the things he did wrong, the crimes that Trump committed. It's about him and the actions he took, not specifically anybody else. So the idea that Jack Smith has done here is just blacked out their names, even if we can easily determine who they actually are, and we can. I'll read some stuff from CC1. You're gonna be like, oh yeah, that was that was Rudy Giuliani. CC2, I'm quite sure, is that guy that has the podcast. What is his name? Fat and ugly and an alcoholic and has red cheeks and a red nose. He did the uh, We Build the Wall scam. Uh, Steve Bannon, that's him. I always forget his name. I don't know why. Why do I always forget his name? Yes, uh, good job, Shinsendo. His name is Steve Bannon. I'm quite sure CC2 is Steve Bannon. I haven't uh, figured out who CC3 or 5 are and 6 are yet. I haven't looked into it. Someone has figured it out. None of these people are actually anonymous. And even if they were, they wouldn't be for very long because the press can just figure out who said what and who tweeted what at what time. All of these things are well known. But yes, CC1 is uh, Giuliani. CC2 is Steve Bannon because of course it is. The most important bit I had it was on three. I, I think I think uh, this part really knocks it out of the park. He lost 2020 and he resorted to crimes to try to stay in office. That is the best sentence right there. When he was defeated in 2020, he resorted to crimes to try and stay in office. If you ever have the bad luck to actually talk to a conservative, that's all you need to say. That sentence 
When he lost in 2020, he resorted to crimes to try and stay in office. This isn't a witch hunt. This isn't because he has ugly hair. This isn't because his mom addresses him funny. This isn't because the Dems don't like him. This isn't a personality thing. When he lost, he resorted to crimes to stay in office. That is why he's on trial. It's not for political gain. It's not weaponization of the DOJ. It's for though that reason. When he lost, he resorted to crimes to stay in office. Uh, so yeah, that uh, sentence is really good. And when it, that conservative that you're talking to claims that it's just out one side out to get Trump, they're ignoring all of the facts that are in this document. They just ignore them. So let's go to page five. I think there's something important there. Although his multiple conspiracies began after the election day in 2020, the defendant laid the groundwork for his crimes well before then. Leading into the election, the defendant's private and campaign advisors, including P6, whoever that is, the private citizen, then a private citizen, which means they weren't for very long, which means that at some point, P6 became an elected citizen, which means maybe they get called up as a witness. Maybe they're in trouble. And P2, so P's are just regular people who are not, at the moment, being charged with anything. Sorry, I didn't have it on the screen because I'm bad at this job. Uh, you think I would be better after all this time, but I'm not. <laughs> so yeah, P6, then a private citizen, and P2, the defendant's campaign manager, we know exactly who that was, informed him that it would be a close contest and that it was unlikely to be finalized on election day, in part because of the time needed to process large numbers of mail-in ballots prompted by the COVID-19 pandemic. They also told the defendant, Donald Trump, that the initial returns on an election, election night might be misleading. Now, I knew this because I'm not an idiot. I know exactly how that red mirage happened. We were told this. If you watched the proper news media, you knew these things were going to happen. You knew that most of the Dems were mailing their votes in. And what would happen is that those votes would be counted and then put all in at the same time. They would count 2,000, they would add 2,000. And it would seem like they suddenly jumped up. We were told this weeks ahead of time. Nobody told Donald Trump, except for these guys who totally told him. They totally told him this was gonna happen. And he didn't listen to them and or doesn't care and can make up the lies about vote dumps. Vote dumps. Privately, the defendant uh, told advisors, including P6 campaign personnel, P7 White House staffer and campaign volunteer, and P8 the vice president's chief of staff, that in a in such a scenario he would simply declare victory before all the ballots were counted and any winner was projected. So he told them that he was just going to declare victory before all the votes are counted. That way, people would believe it. Publicly, the defendant began to plant the seeds for that false declaration. In the months leading up to the election, he refused to say whether he would accept the res election results, insisted that he would lose the election only if by fraud. So before any of this happens, before he's brought up on any of these charges, he's been telling people that he is going to just declare victory. He doesn't care what the facts are. He doesn't care what the numbers are. He's going to say that he won. Uh, there's, a, there, there's a lot of quotes here setting the scene. Jack Smith is... What he's doing here with this whole document is trying to read Trump's mind and intentions. A human's motivation is an internal thing, but with evidence and the actions they take and the statements they make, you can try to form a coherent understanding of what Trump was thinking. And that's what he's thinking. Just declare victory, people will accept it. And if they don't, you can call them liars later. Uh, so, yeah, we've got all these uh, wonderful quotes from Donald Trump. You can read all of them if you want. The link is on my uh, Discord. You can go there and get the link. And it also, it's like public. This is public information. Anybody can, can look it up. But we're all here to feel it together. And I appreciate you being here to feel it together with me. So, uh, bro gaslit his cult to believe he won no matter what. Exactly. Okay, by October 2020, a private political advisor who had worked for the defendant's 2016 presidential campaign began to assist with the defendant's re-election effort. Three days before the election, P1 described the defendant's plan to a private gathering of supporters. And what Trump's going to do is just declare victory, right? He's going to declare victory. That doesn't mean he's the winner. He's just going to say he's the winner. Amazing. I love it. Fantastic. <sighs> After explaining that Biden supporters favored voting by mail, P1 stated further, and so they're going to have a natural disadvantage and Trump's going to take advantage of it. That's our strategy. He's going to de declare himself a winner. I love that this is their strategy. 
I love that Republicans don't plan to win. They just plan to cheat. I mean, he's saying it right here. He's letting you know, hey, we, we know we're not going to win. We know we're going to lose. But here's how we're going to cheat. Pressing the thumbs up button will release chemicals in your human brain that will make you feel. In the immediate post-election period, while the defendant claimed fraud without proof, his private operatives sought to create chaos. This is what I always say that the Republicans are all about. They're all about that chaos. Uh, rather than to seek clarity at polling places where states were continuing to tabulate votes. For example, on November 4th, a campaign employee agent and co-conspirator of the defendant tried to sow confusion when the ongoing vote count at the TCF Center in Detroit, Michigan, looked unfavorable for the defendant. So Trump is losing. Then, when a colleague at the TFC Center told uh, P5, we think this batch of votes heavily in Biden's favor, is correct. He responded, find a reason that it isn't. Hey, bud, we've got this large stack of uh, legitimate Biden votes. And he says, find a reason they aren't legitimate. Give me options to file litigation against Americans and their legitimate votes. When your colleague suggested that there was about to be an unrest reminiscent of the Brooks Brothers riot, the Brooks Brothers riot is what happened back in 2000 when Al Gore lost because a bunch of people got uh, violent and they stopped counting votes. Uh, if, if you're too young, you don't remember this, but a bunch of people got violent and stopped them from counting the votes. And then the Supreme Court decided that, eh, you're fine. Doesn't matter. Don't count. Stop counting. You, you counted enough. They said, stick with your previous answer, which was George W. Bush winning. If they had continued to uh, count the votes and that riot had not happened, Al Gore would have gotten more votes and he would have won the state of Florida. So this is not the first time. Jan 6 is not the first time Republicans have rioted to get what they want. When the colleague suggested that there was about to be unrest reminiscent of the Brooks Brothers riot, a violent effort to stop the vote count in Florida after the 2000 presidential election, uh, he responded with, make them riot. Do it. Do it. This wasn't Donald Trump who said this. It was, it was P5. Whoever P5 is, I'm sure we can figure out who it is. The uh, internet sleuths are probably all over it already. The mainstream media is going to be on top of this. They're going to know exactly who all of these people are b before long. Uh, the defendant's campaign operatives and supporters use similar tactics at other tabulation centers, including at Philadelphia, and the defendant sometimes used the resulting confrontations to falsely claim that his election observers were being denied proper access, thus serving as a predicate to the defendant's claim that the fraud must have occurred in the observer's absence. Exactly. Cause chaos. Cause trouble. Make shit dangerous. Then claim that you're the victim. Contrary to the defendant's public claims of victory immediately following Election Day, his advisors informed him that he would likely lose. <laughs> they told him he was going to lose. He knew this. On November 7th, in a private campaign meeting that included P2, P3, P4, and White House staffer P9, who came to serve as a conduit for information from the campaign to the defendant, campaign staff told the defendant that he had only a slim chance of prevailing in the election and that any potential success was contingent on the defending defendant winning all ongoing vote counts or litigation in Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin. Within a week of that assessment, on November 13th, the defendant's campaign conceded its litigation in Arizona, meaning that based on his campaign advisor's previous assessments, the defendant had lost the election. And he knew it. That's the important bit. He knew he lost. After the 13th of November in 2020, any time Donald Trump tells you that he won, he's lying. He said it a week ago. You know, Vance said it yesterday that he won. Vance said it during the debate two days ago. They're lying to you. Uh, the same day, in an implicit acknowledgement that he had no lawful way to prevail, the defendant sidelined the existing campaign staff responsible for mounting his legal election challenges, from P2, P3, and others who were telling the defendant the truth that he did not want to hear that he had lost. The defendant turned to co-conspirator one, Rudy Giuliani, a private attorney who was willing to falsely claim victory and spread knowingly false claims of election fraud. The campaign staff who told Donald Tr Trump the truth, got removed. They got canned. They got kicked out of their positions and told, we do not need you here anymore because they were telling Trump the truth. There's no room for that. He doesn't want that. He doesn't need it. Nobody wants that. 
He does not have room for the truth. If you're here spreading truth, you need to be somewhere else. Go away. He surrounds himself with people who tell him what he wants to hear because he is a toddler. His brain is broken. He is, has the mentality of a very small child. And if you do not tell him the things he wants to hear, he will throw a fit. He will kick you out of your job. He will get rid of you. He will chase you out of the room and he will throw a tantrum if baby doesn't get what he wants the way he wants it. Page 12, because I took notes. Some of the, I'm skipping around a little bit, but it's because it gets a little boring and it's very hard to read. It's 165 pages. So we're going to, we're going to keep on keeping on. If you've got any questions, if you've got any ideas, uh, top of the chat, tell me what you're thinking. Okay, so hey, here we go. The defendant knew that his claims of outcome determinative fraud were false, and this kind of proves why they are. And then this goes on to all these people who told him that he was uh, that he lost and that he did not win. They're telling him over and over again. He knows that he lost. Anytime after November, Donald Trump said, I won, he's lying, and he knows he's lying. Uh, let's see, page 12. In the post-election period, Pence, the defendant's own running bait, who he had directed to assess fraud allegations, told the defendant that he had seen no evidence of outcome determinative fraud in the election. Fraud in the election. The vice president, who was also on that ticket, told him there was no outcome determinative fraud. It was a free and fair election. Uh, this was in one of my many conversations the defendant and Pence had as running mates, in which they discussed their shared electoral interests. Pence gradually and gently tried to convince the defendant to accept the lawful results of the election, even if it meant they lost. These conversations included, and he uh, describes uh, a bunch of the conversations. Pence told him he lost. Mike Pence slowly, gradually tried to convince Trump that he lost, because you can't just tell him a thing he doesn't want to hear. He would have booted the <laughs> vice president out, and eventually he did. Why is Vance up on that stage last night instead of uh, Mike Pence? Because he got P Pence got kicked out for telling the truth and doing the legal correct things. If you do legal correct things around Donald Trump, you eventually will catch his ire because he does not do legal correct things, even if they're true, even if they're proper. He throws a tantrum like a baby and gets rid of you. So I'll scoop, skip on down to page 15. This is all just uh, all the things that Mike Pence told him. Mike Pence told him, you lost, you lost, you lost, you lost, you lost. I have to get used to it. The defendant and his co-conspirators also demonstrated their deliberate disregard for the truth and thus their knowledge of falsity when they repeatedly changed the numbers in their baseless fraud allegations from day to day. At trial, the government will introduce several instances of this pattern. So Jack Smith is saying, when we go to trial, we will discuss this, uh, in which the defendant and co-conspirators' lies were proved by the fact that they made the figures up out of whole cloth. They were making up numbers. One example concerns the defendant and co-conspirators' claims about non-citizens voting in Arizona. You heard about this. We all heard about this. All the illegal immigrants who voted in Arizona. The conspirators started with the allegation that 36,000 non-citizens voted in Arizona. Five days later, it was beyond credulity that a few hundred thousand didn't vote. So we went from 36 to hundreds of thousands. Three weeks later, the bare minimum was 40 or 50,000. So then we came back down to 40 or 50,000. The reality is about 250,000. Days after that, uh, the assertion was 32,000. And ultimately, the conspirators landed back where they started at 36,000, a false figure that they, they never verified or corroborated. Jack Smith is a very good lawyer. And what he's telling you here is that when they say these numbers, they're making them up. If they had a solid number, stuck to that number the entire time, and could show the court how and when they got to that number, maybe they're not lying. But they can't do any of that. All they can do is make up numbers. And when it changes so drastically from 36,000 to hundreds of thousands to 250,000, back to 50,000, then down to 36,000 again, it suggests that they are liars. A court is where you go to prove evidence and stuff like that. So, uh, fake numbers. Lots of fun. Ultimately, the defendant's steady stream of disinformation in the post-election period culminated in a speech that he gave at a privately funded, privately organized rally 
at the Ellipse on the morning of Jan 6th, in advance of the official proceedings in which Congress was to certify the election in favor of Biden. In his speech, the defendant repeated the same lies about election fraud in Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin that had been publicly or directly debunked. The defendant used these lies to inflame and motivate the large and angry crowd of his supporters to march on the Capitol and disrupt the certification proceedings. This is why we have to uh, try him. He didn't just make up a bunch of lies on Twitter. He didn't just pass misinformation on Facebook. He actually lied about the election and inflamed and motivated the large and angry crowd to march on the Capitol. Uh, the defendant aimed deceit at the targeted states to alter their ascertainment of a, an appointment of electors. So this is the fake electors. This is what this is. This is what we're looking at right here. So this is page 16. This section, um, I think, is about yeah Arizona. I think he goes to, to each state. So yeah, he, he talks about the uh, fake electors in every state. The Arizona section has every tweet and public statement that Trump and his team made and lays out the premise that he knew he lost tried to get the fake electors installed. There is no such thing as alternate slates of electors. It's not a thing. That doesn't make any sense. There's the official electors, and then there's fake electors, which is why you can, in fact, call them fake electors. They are entirely fake. It's not some simple trick that doctors don't want you to know. They're fake. They're liars spreading lies. Uh, so the lawyers had to trick people into covering this stuff and becoming a fake elector. Uh, and then it skips down quite a few pages. Let me skip down quite a few pages down to like page 47 or something like that. Because this is just a, a, a list of all the things he said in Arizona. Uh, that's a lie. They're just documenting all of the lies over and over and over and over again. Uh, here's December 4th, all the things that went wrong, and then January 2nd, and then all of these things, that they just lies. Then here's all the lies they told in Georgia. These are easily verifiable. You can find out what he said. You can get the videotapes. You can interview people. You can ask them. You can look at his tweets and know that he is a liar. So when you bring all these things in to court, you can prove that they're lies and they're not true. If he's done all these lies, why did he do all these lies? So that he could stay in office even though he knew he lost. D, the defendant organized and caused his electors to submit fraudulent certificates, creating the false appearance that states submitting competing electoral slates. So this is the important bit. This is why we're mad at him. This is why he has broken the law. He organized through Ju Rudy Giuliani, fake electors to submit fraudulent certificates, creating an appearance that the states submitted competing electoral slates. If I lie to the DMV, I'm, I've committed a crime. You're not allowed to send fake documents to the government. That's a crime. And that's exactly what he's doing. He paid lawyers to round up a bunch of idiots, have them sign documents that says we are the electors and we vote for Donald Trump in Georgia, even though he lost in Georgia. And then they took those documents to the governor. They took those uh, documents to the Senate. They took it to the House of Representatives, and they tried like hell to give it to the vice president. Fake documents. That is why he's on trial. Not because we don't like him. Not because we think his hair looks stupid. I mean, my hair looks stupid. But that's why he's on trial. Breaking laws. Fraudulent documents. Don't let the Republicans gaslight you. Don't let them trick you. And to say this is a witch hunt, this is, this is there's nothing going on here. This isn't important. They're just mad about his uh, uh, America first policy. Nonsense. By late November 2020, every effort, both legitimate and illegitimate, that the defendant had made to challenge the results of the election had been unsuccessful. The defendant, his campaign, and their allies had lost or withdrawn one election lawsuit after another in the seven targeted states. And the defendant and co-conspirators efforts to overturn the legitimate vote count through a pressure campaign on the state officials and through false claims made directly to state legislators in formal or pseudo hearings continued to fail. So in early December, the defendant and his co-conspirators developed a new plan regarding the targeted states that the defendant had lost. Those states. Uh, they would organize the people who would have served as the defendant's electors had he won the popular vote and cause them to sign and send Pence, the president of the Senate, certifications in which they falsely represented themselves as legitimate electors. Fake electors who had cast electoral votes for the defendant. Ultimately, the defendant and his co-conspirators would use these fraudulent electoral votes, uh, mere pieces of paper, without the lawful imprimatur, imprimatur, 
uh, of the state executive to falsely claim that in his ministerial role presiding over the Jan 6 certification, Pence had the authority to choose the fraudulent slates over the legitimate ones or to send the reportedly dueling slates back to the state legislature for consideration anew. So they wanted the vice president to just pick and choose the electors he likes based on nothing other than his feelings. If he likes what they had to say, he chooses them. If he doesn't like what they have to say, he doesn't choose them based on nothing. Doesn't matter who voted for who. Doesn't matter how many votes uh, Biden got or how many Trump got. It just comes down to what the vice president feels like at any given moment. Terrible way to run a government. On December 8th, CC5 spoke on the phone with P53, a private attorney whom CC1 and CC6 had identified as a contact for the plan in Arizona. Following the call, P53 recounted the conversation in an email. So, Here's what was emailed. This was emailed. This is actual like evidence. I just talked to a, the gentleman who did that memo, CC5. His idea is basically that all of us, Georgia, Wisconsin, Arizona, Pennsylvania, have our electors send in their votes, even though the votes aren't legal under federal law. This guy's super on board for this because they're not signed by the governor. So that members of Congress can fight about whether they should be counted on January 6th. We should send in fake information so that Congress can fight about it. Uh, they could potentially argue that they're not bound by federal law because they are Congress and they make the law. So Congress can just do whatever the hell they want, according to this guy. Kind of a wild, creative uh, idea. I'm happy to discuss it. My comments to him is that I guess there's no harm in it. And what could possibly go wrong, legally at least, uh, would we would just be sending in fake electoral votes to Pence that so that someone in Congress can make an objection when they start counting votes and start arguing that the fake votes should be counted. So this guy knows that they're fake, accepts that they're fake, wants the fake information to be tossed in there so that everybody at Congress can just fight about it and maybe we'll come out on top. He doesn't care about votes. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about your rights to vote. He doesn't care about democracy. This is why I'm okay with saying Donald Trump is a uh, threat to democracy. No, 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 you can't say that. They'll shoot at him. Not my problem. Stop being a threat to democracy. And crazy people stop shooting at him also. He doesn't care about democracy. P53 is a witness to a crime and described it as such. He's laying it out in plain language, Trump's plan. Yeah, so he's he's he knows it's fake. He thinks that it's not illegal, but he's okay with doing it anyway, uh, allowing the VP to pick and choose from a group of electors as legitimate, which are, are the ones are alternative. I, I'm not kidding when I'm suggesting here that this plan, if they are allowed to continue with this, if Donald Trump doesn't get tried for this stuff, it will happen again this year. It'll happen again next uh, election. It'll happen again and again and again and again. Every time Republicans are uh, involved in an election, which is all of them. We are one right-leaning election away from a dictatorship because the alternate elector plan would be allowed. The Dems wouldn't use it. No, no, no. The Dems would never use it. Uh, they have ethics, you see. They actually do respect the vote and the democracy. But the Republicans, no, their VP will pick and choose which groups of electors are legitimate and which ones are alternative, leading to every swing state not being decided by the voters, but by the current vice president. Imagine that system. You, the voters don't matter. Whoever the vice president is chooses and picks which, which swing state gets their votes counted and which ones get their uh, votes tossed. Under this plan, voting in a swing state would not be decided by voters, but by the current vice president. Voting doesn't matter anymore at this, to at this point. It's merely a suggestion that the current VP is free to ignore. That is a threat to democracy. And that's why I won't stop calling Donald Trump a threat to our country. It does not matter how many crazy people take shots at him. It's still a true statement. Facts about Trump trying to steal the election don't care about your butt hurt feelings if he gets shot at. Uh, in practice, the fraudulent elector plan played out somewhat differently in each targeted state. In general, the co-conspirators deceived the defendant's elector nominees in the same way as the defendant and CC2 deceived P39 by falsely claiming that their electoral votes would be used only if ongoing litigation were resolved in the defendant's favor. So this is CC2, uh, Steve Bannon, lying to stupid people, saying, no, 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 no. We're not sending fake electors. What we're sending is 
separate electors just in case there's a legal reason to do so. He's lying. He knows he's lying. He doesn't care. Uh, he is a liar, so it doesn't matter. A select few of the defendant's agents and elector nominees, however, had insight into the ultimate plan to use the fraudulent electors' certificates to disrupt the congressional certification on January 6th. They want to disrupt the system. In several states, the defendant and co-conspirators... Uh, yeah, it's alternative facts. Yeah, exactly. Co-conspirators and agents were unable to convince all of the defendant's electoral nominees to participate. P-57, for instance, a former U.S. representative and U.S. attorney at one of the defendant's electoral nominees in Pennsylvania who opted out of the plan told the state party vice chair trying to organize the defendant's electors, this is the good part, that he would not participate because the plan did not follow the proper process and was illegal. So, P-57 told these people that what they're doing with the alternative electors is illegal. And instead of stopping, the Trump team continued. Hey, Shinsendo, can I hire you to uh, rob a bank? No, that's illegal. Okay, well, I'll just ask somebody else. No, that's not how that works, man. Stop doing the thing if you find out that it's illegal. Don't just go ask somebody else who's stupider than you. That's what they did. They asked this one guy. He's like, nah, man, that's illegal. I ain't gonna do that. And they're like, oh, okay, well, we'll just ask someone stupider. And that's what they did. They just asked someone stupider. All this is just more about the fake electors and all the stuff like that and uh, describing them and all the things that they went through and how they were lied to and all that fun stuff. The defendant attempted to persuade Pence to reject votes cast by duly appointed electors and choose the defendant's fraudulent ones. So Donald Trump tried to pressure Pence into accepting the fake alternative uh, electors instead of the ones that were actually supposed to be there. That's a crime, you see. You're not allowed to do that. Uh, as the defendant's various attempts to target the states failed and the Jan 6 congressional certification approached, the defendant and co-conspirators turned their attention to Pence, who, as president of the Senate, that's the job of the vice president, presided over the certification proceeding in service of a new plan to enlist Pence to use his role to fraudulently alter the election results So that at the Jan 6 certification proceeding. That's why they needed all the people. That's why they he needed to be there. It's a very boring thing. He's just supposed to count the votes. We already know the answer. It's not like there's any su surprises. Uh, the defendant and his co-conspirators against again used deceit. They lied to Pence, telling him that there was substantial election fraud, concealing their orchestration of the plan to manufacture fraudulent election slates, as well as their intention to use the fake slates to attempt to obstruct the congressional certification. And they lied to the public, falsely claiming... Uh, that Pence had the authority during the certification process to reject electoral votes. I don't know what any of that means, but it sounds bad. It's bad. Yeah. See, I know. Thank you. Good job. Brilliant. He's on to something. Uh, so, yeah, they knew they were lying and they tried to convince Pence to do it anyway. The defendant first publicly turned his sights towards Jan 6th in the early morning hours of December 19th. At 1.42 a.m., the defendant posted on Twitter a copy of a f report falsely alleging fraud and wrote, Statistically impossible to have lost the 2020 election. Big protest in D.C. on January 6th. Be there. It will be wild. When CC5 learned about the tweet, he sent a link about it to another of the Wisconsin attorneys who had met with the defendant in the Oval Office on December 16th wrote, Wow, based on the three days ago, I think we have a unique understanding of this. Later on the 19th, the defendant called Pence and told him of his plans for a rally on January 6th and said that he thought it would be a big day and good to have lots of their supporters in town. So the defendant told Pence that there would be a lot of big, important people. There's going to be a whole mob of people there on January the 6th. The defendant and his co-conspirators recognized that Pence, by virtue of his ministerial role presiding over the January 6th congressional certification, would need to be a key part of their plan to obstruct in the certification proceeding. On December 23rd, in a memorandum drafted with CC5 assistant, CC2 outlined a plan for Pence to gavel in the defendant as the winner of the election based on the false claim that seven states have transmitted dual slates of electors to the president of the Senate. So they wanted him to just choose who should win. CC5 and CC2 just want the vice president to decide which electors are valid. We have it in writing that these two people are abandoning the law in favor of whatever the vice president feels like. Conservatives do not respect the law. They do not give a shit what the law actually is. The law is just a bunch of hurdles that you have to get past to get what the fuck you want. 
That's not how the law is actually wor- is supposed to be operating. They don't understand what they're talking about. They don't respect it. They don't respect you. They don't respect our country. They don't respect the fucking Constitution. They don't care about any of that. But I'm ranting. Okay. On December 25th, CC5 proposed in a text message to CC2 and CC6 that Pence permit an unlimited filibuster of the certification in violation of the ECA and ultimately gavel in the defendant as president. When CC2 asked, is Pence really likely to be on board with this? CC6 responded, let's keep this off text for now. They were doing conspiracies and crimes. And one of them was like, hey, dude, let's not text this. Because if people read it later, they would know we're criminals. Kind of a a guilty conscience he's got there. Let's keep this off text. Uh, Why keep it off text? Because you know you're committing crimes. At this point, the conspirators plotted to manipulate Pence. They worked in concert to enlist Pence to act unlawfully and to ratchet up public pressure from the defendant supporters that he do so. The defendant began to directly and repeatedly pressure Pence at the same time that he continued summoning his supporters to amass at Washington, D.C. on the day of the congressional certification. On December 25th, when Pence called the defendant to wish him Merry Christmas, the defendant raised a certification and told Pence that he had discretion as his role as the president of the Senate. Pence emphatically responded, you know, I don't think I have the authority to change the outcome. Pence is saying something true here. Correct. He does not have the authority to change the votes for an entire state after they voted and counted and been certified by their governors. He does not have that authority. He does not have that power. He knows that because he, even though he is a Republican, has some little bit of ethics some tiny bit of principle he knows that voting matters donald trump doesn't know this cc1 cc2 do not give a shit about your vote the next day the defendant tweeted never give up see everyone in dc on jan 6th so like he talked to them he he told the guy i need you to do this illegal thing and then he keeps saying no hey hey mike hey pence do this illegal thing mike pence keeps saying no and then donald trump keeps tweeting hey mob show up in dc on january the 6th that's what he keeps telling them pence knows he doesn't have the authority so that's good on december 28th i think yeah this is the important bit at 11 a.m so this is an important uh time breakdown right here at 11 a.m on january 1st the defendant donald trump called pence to berate him because he had learned that pence had filed a brief opposing the relief sought in gomert complicated legal thing who cares when pence explained as he had before that he did not believe that he had the power under the Constitution to decide which votes to accept. The defendant told him that hundreds of thousands of people, they're going to hate your guts. The people are going to think you're stupid and you're too honest. Donald Trump told his VP that he's too honest. What does that mean? That means Donald Trump knows that he's lying. He knows he's lying. He knows he is trying to get Pence to do an illegal, unconstitutional thing. And Pence keeps saying no. And he's like, you're too honest. You gotta be, you gotta be crooked to be a politician, according to Donald Trump. Trump is trying to pressure and threaten the VP into breaking the law and abandoning the Constitution. And when Pence says no, he says, you're too honest. That proves that Trump knows he's lying, knows what he's doing is an illegal scheme. How can anybody trust him after that? Immediately before the call, the defendant had spoken to. Okay, so at 10 a.m. He talks to his lawyers, P1 and P, uh, uh, CC1, which is Rudy Giuliani, and they told him that he should uh, that he should convince Pence to break the law. Pence says no. Within hours of the call with Pence, that where he called him too honest, the defendant reminded supporters to travel to Washington for the certification proceeding, tweeting the big protest rally in Washington D.C. will take place at 11 a.m. on Jan 6th. Location details to follow. Stop the steal. The next day on January 2nd, uh, all these people appeared on a podcast. Great. This is Donald Trump gently threatening the vice president, subtly threatening him. Hey, they're going to hate you. They're going to be mad at you. I told them that you could do this thing. It's not true, but it doesn't matter. I told them it's true. They're going to believe it. So what I need you to do is do the illegal thing. Pence says no. And then Trump threatens him with a fucking mob of people. Don't let them lie to you about Jan 6. Trump knew they were going to be there. He intentionally wanted them to be there, and they were there violently because he wanted them to be. We'll get to that here in just a minute. That's coming up. Spoilers. Stick around. Uh, The defendant did not leave the pressure campaign to his co-conspirators. He redoubled his own efforts. 
On January 5th, shortly before CC2 meeting with P58, the defendant tweeted, The vice president has the power to reject fraudulently chosen electors and designate the defendant as the winner uh, of the Electoral College vote. That afternoon, the defendant met privately with Pence in the Oval Office. So Jan 5th, he's telling everybody that Mike Pence gets to decide the election. It's not true. It's never been true. Wouldn't be true, ever. Shouldn't be true. That afternoon, the defendant met privately with Pence in the Oval Office. During the meeting, the defendant once again told Pence, I think you have the power to decertify. When Pence was unmoved, the th- defendant threatened to criticize him publicly. Um, we're going to have to say that you did a great service. He's going to turn the mob on him. He's going to go out on the news and say, Mike Pence let us down. This concerned uh, P8, to whom Pence had relayed the in- defendant's threat, to the point that he alerted Pence's Secret Service detail. So P8, whoever the hell that is, was like, hey, the president just kind of threatened the vice president if he doesn't do an illegal thing. Uh, Next still, the defendant initiated a phone call with Pence and one or or two other private attorneys, likely including CC1, and again raised the scenario of the vice president sending the electors slates to the state legislatures. Pence again, somebody at P58 uh, pointed out such a strategy violated the ECA. Right. So the next important thing is page 72. The defendant continued his pressure campaign on Pence that evening after a New York Times article that night detailed the afternoon's private conversation with Pence had rejected the defendant's demand to act unlawfully. The defendant directed P4 to issue a statement rebutting it and approved the statement at 928. Minutes later, the defendant called Pence and told him, you got to get tough tomorrow. You got to be tough tomorrow. After Concluding the call with Pence, the defendant sequentially spoke with P1, followed by CC2. Then at around 10 p.m. that night, the defendant issued a public statement that which read, The vice president and I are in total agreement that the vice president has the power to act. So he's lying to the American people. He's telling these people that the vice president has power and authority that the vice president does not and has never had. A statement that the defendant knew was a lie from Pence's repeated and firm rejections of his efforts. But he gave false hope to the defendant's supporters arriving in the city at the defendant's request and maximized pressure on Pence. He's giving the mob false hope so that if they lose that false hope, they will get violent. He is playing them like a fiddle. He is using this mob as a weapon, as a cudgel, to create chaos so that he can continue to win. Trump tells his fans that Pence can fix the election fraud and that he will be the one responsible for the win or for the loss. He reminds those hundreds of thousands of people that are going to be at the rally tomorrow who is to blame or who to celebrate. Uh, Then it goes on to list the lies and deceit Trump spread over the next few days. It didn't have to be real or solid info. Just sow some chaos, spread some misinfo, create some doubt. And then we go on to page 75... Uh, when the defendant took the stage at the Ellipse rally to speak to the supporters who had uh, gathered there at his urging, he knew that Pence had refused, once and for all, to use the defendant's fraudulent lecture certificates. He knew that Pence had already turned it down. The defendant also knew that he had only one last hope to prevent Biden's certification as president, the large, angry crowd standing in front of him. So for more than an hour, the defendant delivered a speech designed to inflame his supporters and motivate them to march on the Capitol. The defendant told his crowd many of the same lies that he'd been telling for months, publicly and privately, including the officials in the targeted states, that he knew were not true. In Arizona, he claimed more than 36,000 ballots had been cast by non-citizens, blah, 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 all the regular lies, 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 lies. The defendant also lied to his rally supporters when he claimed that certain states wanted to reconsider or recertify their duly appointed electors. He told them, that crowd, that some of these states wanted it to come back to them. That's a lie. Uh, By the way, Pennsylvania has now seen all of this. They didn't know because it was so quick. They had to vote. They voted. But now they see all of this stuff. And it's come to light. doesn't happen that fast. And they wanted to recertify their votes. They want to recertify. But the only way that can happen is if Mike Pence agrees to send it back. Mike Pence has to agree to send it back. In response to this lie about Pennsylvania, the defendant's crowd began to shout, send it back, send it back. The state of Pennsylvania did not, in fact, want that. They never asked for that. They had already certified the proper voting procedures and uh, results. They didn't want it back. He's just making shit up. Uh, The defendant gave his supporters false hope that Pence could take action and change the results of the election and claim that Pence had the authority to do so. He falsely told the crowd that Pence would still do the right thing, do the right thing, 
and halt the certification, and he extemporized lines about the vice president through the speech, including the indirect th- threat, Mike Pence, I hope you're going to stand up for the good of our Constitution, for the good of our country, and if you're not, I'm going to be very disappointed in you. I'll tell you right now, I'm not hearing good stories. He's saying that to this crowd of hundreds of thousands of people that he brought there intentionally to cause damage, to cause chaos. He wanted to scare Mike Pence into doing illegal things. That is why he's on trial. That is why he deserves to go on trial. He knew he only had one option left, and that is to cause chaos and climb on top of the bodies. We all saw what happened on Jan 6. We've seen the videos. I've showed them myself, and uh, everybody knows what's up with them. So we're going to skip down to page 79 as it kind of describes some of the things that we all know kind of happened. So again, important timelines. Timelines are important when you're running a legal case. Very good, very important. At about 1.30 p.m., the defendant settled into the dining room of the Oval Office. 1.30 p.m. He spent the afternoon viewing Twitter on his phone while the dining room television played Fox News coverage of events at the Capitol. At 2.13 p.m., so 2.13, the crowd at the Capitol broke into the building and forced the Senate to recess. Within minutes, staffers fled the Senate chambers carrying the legitimate electors physical certificates and votes of and certificates of ascertainment next to the senate chamber a group of rioters chased the u.s capitol police officer up a flight of stairs to within 40 feet of where pence was sheltering with his family as they did so the rioters shouted at the officer in search of the public officials where the fuck are they at where the fuck are they counting the votes at why are you protecting them you're a fucking traitor on the other side of the capitol the house was also forced to recess Fox News coverage of the events in the Capitol included uh, at about 2.12 p.m. reports of the Capitol being on lockdown and showed video footage of the large crowds within the restricted area surrounding the Capitol. Much of the crowd was wearing clothing, carrying flags, evidencing their allegiance to the defendant. At 2.20 p.m., a video of the crowds of the Capitol lawn at West Terrace was shown alongside Chiron stating the certif- certification vote paused as protests were up on Capitol Hill. 2.24 Trump was alone in the dining room when he issued a tweet attacking Pence and fueling the ongoing riot. Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our constitution, giving states a chance to certify a corrected set of facts, not the fraudulent or inaccurate ones which they were asked to previously certify. USA demands the truth. So this is important because Trump is on Twitter watching and has Fox News on the TV monitoring the events. He knows the riot is happening. He knows people are storming that Capitol. At 224, he points that riot at Mike Pence, making good on the threats that he has been making for the past couple of weeks. He is orchestrating an angry mob. He is directing them at the person he wanted to hurt. He is literally now a mob boss. Don't let the Republicans lie to you and say this was a peaceful sightseeing tour. J.D. Vance, just the other night, said Trump left peacefully on the 20th. Horseshit, J.D. Vance. He caused a riot on the 6th, so he did not leave peacefully on the 20th. He was organizing a coup on the 6th. You fucking liar. Now, let's see, page 81. Uh, One minute later, at 2.25, so at 2.24, when he... uh, Uh, directed the mob at uh, the vice president. One minute later, at 2.25, the Secret Service was forced to evacuate Pence to a secure location because of the fucking mob. At the Capitol throughout the uh, afternoon, members of the crowd shouted, chanted, hang Mike Pence. Where is Pence? Bring him out. The traitor Pence. Several rioters in those uh, chanting crowds wore hats and carried flags, evidencing their allegiance to the defendant. In the years since January 6th, the defendant has refused to take responsibility for putting Pence in danger, instead blaming Pence. On March 13th, 23... He said, had Mike Pence sent the votes back to the legislature, they wouldn't have had a problem with Jan 6th. So in many ways, you could blame him for Jan 6th. He had, had he sent them back to Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, the states, I believe, number one, you would have had a different outcome. But I also believe you wouldn't have had Jan 6th, as we call it. If you just give the babies what they want, if you just let the man cheat and let him win, even though he got fewer votes, you won't get violence. That's terrorism, man. Give me what I want or I will aim mob violence at you. Terrorism. Donald Trump is a terrorist. Page 85. Oh, and then, yeah, and then this this describes all of the things that happened uh, at Jan 6th and stuff like that. Okay, legal framework. So what we've got here from this point on, page 85 and beyond, is Jack Smith laying out the groundwork for why Donald Trump is not immune for these things. He's suggesting this is a private scheme, 
not a public one. In Trump, the Supreme Court held that the former presidents are immune from prosecution for core official acts, enjoy at least a rebuttable uh, presumption of immunity for other official acts, and have no immunity for unofficial acts, and remanded to the court for further proceeding consistent with holding blah, 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 speak. This section sets forth the applicable legal principles, and then section three applies in the categories, blah, blah, blah. And he's going to make good arguments for why this isn't official actions. Core presidential conduct that Congress has no power to regulate, for which the former president has absolute immunity. He's going to say all of this is number three, unofficial conduct. None of the allegations or evidence is protected by presidential immunity. This entire thing, 165 pages, and all the evidence that he will release later, are covered by presidential immunity, according to Jack Smith. Now, that sets up a weird legal argument because his Donald Trump's uh, attorneys are going to say that every bit of it is an official act. Jack Smith is going to say, no, no, none of it is. The courts are going to have to decide that. It is very difficult because the executive branch has no role in the certification proceeding. And indeed, the president was purposely excluded from it by design, prosecuting the defendant for his corrupt efforts regarding the pen regarding Pence poses no danger to the executive branch's authority or functioning. This might be this might be the most important part of the document right here. It really is. Because the executive branch has no role in the certification proceeding, and indeed the president was purposely excluded from it by design, prosecuting the defendant for his corrupt efforts regarding Pence poses no danger to the executive branch's authority or functioning. That's what he's saying basically to the Supreme Court. This wasn't an official act. The uh, the president of the United States that has nothing to do with the certification of the state's votes. It's not a, not under his job description, man. The people are voting for him, the states are counting it, and the states are sending their results to the Congress. Fucking nothing at all to do with the president. And by him jamming his dick in there and getting all up in the way and causing corruption and chaos, he is breaking the law. Will the Supreme Court accept this? and allowed Jack Smith to continue with the prosecution? Or will they deny it and abandon all laws, facts, and reason, and the entire Constitution? Well, they might do that. They are religious and conservative, after all. Uh, if the facts aren't on their side, they will ignore them. If the law is not on their side, they will change it. If the people are not on their side, they will disregard them. And if the Constitution is not on their side, they will maliciously misinterpret it. Uh, the rest of this is l really good legal arguments for why the actions were not official and therefore not immune. Uh, you can read that on your own, but uh, it's just a rehashing of all the contradictory things. And Jack Smith is weaving a legally sound argument about why Trump is acting unofficially rather than officially. So it really does come down to the Supreme Court. This will end up in the Supreme Court. Won't they just say he's immune? No, he would be immune from prosecution. If these things had something to do with the president's job, Smith is suggesting that this is not a part of the job to conspire to lie to the American people about an election. <laughs> That's not a part of the president's job. Shocking, I know. I read that Giuliani texted the planes to for Michigan to the wrong person. Yeah, he did do that. That's in one of them as well. Um, uh, I, Giuliani will be uh, prosecuted at a later time uh, for his stuff as well. He's a co-conspirator. He's CC1. He's co-conspirator number one. Let's skip down. The rest of this document, honestly, is just legal arguments to why he's not immune, which is nice and fun and cool, but a little boring. So you can read it on your own if you like. I'm not going to read it right now. It's a little boring. We're going to skip down to the conclusion, which is many pages down. Uh, if you're watching, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. This is I think this is interesting. I know maybe not everybody likes it, but uh, if you're watching on YouTube, give it a thumbs up, a like, and a follow, and all that fun stuff. Or hop in a chat and tell me what you're thinking. Yeah, all of this is blah, 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 blah. This is a legal speak for why each of these individual acts shouldn't be considered an official act. And so this is all good law. Now, I'm not going to read it. It's boring. Boring shit. But Jack Smith has put together a really good case, a really good reason for why he should not be immune from these things. He's not working as the president. He's actually working as a private citizen trying to get elected. So conclusion, based on a fact bound analysis, that's what we skipped over for the past 50 pages was the fact bound analysis that Jack Smith has created. He's a good lawyer. He's very smart. He created a fact bound analysis for the reasons explained above. The court should determine that the conduct described in the factual proffer of section one of this motion is not subject to presidential immunity, not subject.
As part of this determination, the court should specify four determinations and do so in a single order. That the government has rebutted the presumption of immunity. Two, that the remaining conduct described in Section 1, that is, conduct other than the official communications with the vice president, was not official. And in the alternative, that the government had rebutted and a, any presumptive immunity for any of the remaining conduct that the court finds to be official. Uh, the government requests additional rulings regarding rebuttal for the uh, conduct of the court, blah, 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 boring, boring, boring. Furthermore, based on the determination that the conduct described in Section 1 is not immune from prosecution, and because Section 1 encompasses all of the allegations in the superseding indictment, the court should further specify that 3. The defendant is subject to trial on the superseding indictment, and 4. That the government is not prohibited at trial from using evidence of the conduct described in Section 1, subject of the latter date. The non-immunity based objections to the court's administration admissibility rulings are the federal rules of evidence great okay lots of uh, legal talk there but that's the important bit right there subject to trial this is jack smith's opening argument it's long it's painful i dig it but it is important because i think it's actually good and properly put together this isn't ramshackle this wasn't rammed through really quickly to get in the way of the election this is well thought out well put together law and legal theory um, so what's going to happen? It's far too late to remove Donald Trump from the ballots. There's no changing that now. If he wins, the Supreme Court will bend and warp any word, any language, any law to make it okay for him to be the president. It won't matter how many of these things that we looked at today are crimes. On October 10th, Judge Shutkin receives the appendix with all of the evidence that Jack Smith used to put together this report. So on the 10th, she's actually going to get the appendix, which is just going to be just way more than what we've got, more than 165 pages, that's for damn sure. And she is going to then decide, she's going to allow Donald Trump's lawyers like a day or two to say, to object to her releasing it as well. They probably won't because they're idiots. And even if they do, she'll shoot them down because they're idiots. So maybe even on the 11th, that will all be released. Unless Trump's lawyers are able to put together some co coherent argument on why it should not be released, because, but they won't because they're stupid. So maybe there's another big, big, big info dump on the 11th. Come by for that. Um, watch the news for that. And then come watch Waldo and we'll look at all the stuff and we'll talk about it. It'll include like grand jury transcripts, FBI footage, interview info. The reporters will be all over that shit, digging through it, looking at all the stuff using the evidence and the dates and the details, they'll be able to do internet sleuthing and determine who all the uh, redacted names are. We know a few of them, obviously. Some of them we don't know yet, but they'll be able to figure it out. Uh, it'll be nuts. When that when that happens, it's going to pop off. It's going to be a wild kind of a thing. Uh, suddenly, sitting senators are going to have to answer about what they knew and when. And we in the online uh, uh, area will debate whether or not they committed crimes. It'll be a good time. So there's that to look forward to. Lots of fun. Lots of drama. There will also be another hearing set at that time. Uh, now, I'm not a lawyer and have not been since the, uh, the event. And I'm legally not allowed to talk about the event. So if I understand it correctly, Trump's lawyers probably won't fight this long list of evidence being introduced. Because if they do, the witnesses would have to be called in and... They don't want that right now. The 77P, the P77, not the CCs, but the Ps, uh, are still slightly, somewhat anonymous. They don't want to be brought in. They're all Republicans. The Republican Party doesn't want them being brought in. Uh, it looks bad for them, uh, coming in one after the other to get cross-examined. The witnesses don't want it. The uh, Donald Trump's lawyers don't want it. It would look bad for them. Trump's lawyers will waive the right to have those witnesses called. This will be misunderstood by Donald Trump, because remember what he does. He misunderstands, he creates a delusion, and then he spreads fear. Donald Trump will go on TV and say that his lawyers didn't, never got to, never got to cross-examine the witnesses. Uh, the judge uh, took his away from us. We, we, we wanted to, but we couldn't get to it. But he'll be lying, you know. His lawyers are willingly going to choose not to bring 77 Republicans and 36 co-conspirators up to the stand one at a time. They'll choose not to do that. Because it's better for them, it's better for the case, it's better for their dependent. But Trump will go on TV and cry about how there were no witnesses, and the judge wouldn't let allow my lawyers to cross-examine the witnesses, prosecutor, prosecutorial misconduct, which had to do uh, election interference. 
So be prepared for that uh, on about the 12th or so. The lawyers will then argue about what should be covered under presidential immunity. Jack Smith, however, has written all of this up in an order to make that claim as difficult as possible. Jack Smith's job is to make that immunity claim as difficult as possible. And remember, Trump's lawyers are idiots. They're going to fight about this for weeks, and then the election's going to happen. If I'm correct in my guesstimates, Trump will lose. But even if he does, all the shit we talked about will happen again. Everything we mentioned today will happen again. The fake news about voter fraud, the same lies about dead voters, the same horse shit about illegal immigrants voting, bamboo DNA in ballots, votes being sent to Venezuela to be flipped by Hugo Chavez's ghost and be sent back as uh, Kamala votes. That's all going to happen again because they didn't get punished last time. It's already kind of started. He's already talked about how illegal people are voting and stuff like that. If we're lucky, there will be such a large blowout by Kamala that there will be less of that nonsense and no actual violence like on Jan 6th. In that situation, the case against Trump will continue with Judge Chutkin. So if he's lost and we don't get a giant Jan 6th because it was a giant blowout and Kamala Harris is 40 uh, points ahead, there probably won't be anything dangerous. There will be very few protests and it won't be anything like Jan 6th. Hopefully that's best case scenario, but it will continue Kamala will not get rid of Jack Smith. She will allow Judge Chutkin to continue. Whatever Chutkin does decide will be appealed, obviously, and in that appeal will be decided, and in that will be appealed again to the Supreme Court. That's going to be years from now. That is 25 if we're lucky. 26, maybe, is a more realistic date for that. Unless Donald Trump wins, in which he makes all of the charges go away. The drama will continue, however. Where are the drama llamas? That's drama llamas in chat. Infinite rerolls. That's right. Rich people get infinite rerolls. Drama llamas. Uh, <laughs> the drama will continue. Jack Smith will get dismissed. If, if Trump wins, the drama continues. Jack Smith gets dismissed and thoroughly investigated by the Republicans in the House, just like Jim Jordan did with uh, Hunter Biden and Hunter Biden's dick pics. Everything Jack Smith has ever done will be called into question, and he will have to be <laughs> too drunk for this negativity. I'm, I just gave you the positivity. I'll give you some more here in just a minute. Uh, I've got a plan. Maybe. Jack Smith will be investigated, investigated by the House Republicans. Uh, judge Shutkin will get the same, and so will the judge from the New York case, Juan Marchand. If any of them have ever had an unpaid parking ticket, it will be turned into a mountain of absolute horrible criticism about how they shouldn't be judges and they're not allowed and none of the things that they've ever done uh, has ever been uh, legitimate and they're incapable of judging Donald Trump. Who do they think they are? They will have charges levied against them, even if they're made up, even if they're trumped up, even if they're dropped or dismissed later, it won't matter. The accusation is what matters to the Trump Republican fans. They need to feel like Jack Smith is a monster. They need to feel like Tony Chutkin is some sort of crazy dem who's on a revenge spree. It's not true, but they need to feel that way. Uh, they think that the law is intended to protect themselves and harm their enemies. That is how a conservative sees the law. Protect us, hurt the others. Protect them the Republicans and Donald Trump and hurt anybody who's against him. Uh, so I'm about done for tonight, but to cap it off, let me give you my final thoughts. Jack Smith has put together a compelling list of facts and evidence. I make it no secret that I think the conservatives have abandoned factuality as a concept. They do not care about the measurable reality of the universe. They will bend any rule to get to the outcome they want. They will abandon the Constitution if following it might harm their boy Donnie. If they cared about facts, they would recognize them, realize that Donald Trump is a criminal, he'd lied right to their faces, and they would stop supporting him. Conservative, please, if there is any conservative listening, don't vote for Donald Trump. You can do that. It's too late to remove him from the ballot, but just leave it blank. Don't vote for him. Leave it blank. You can do that. And I'm not telling you to vote for Kamala. No, 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 no. Don't vote for Kamala. Just leave the presidential choice blank. You can still vote for your governor and your senator and your local reps, and you can just leave the Trump space blank. Then years from now, when the trials are finished and we have sentenced him, you can honestly say, I left it blank. I didn't support the Dem, but I also didn't support the threat to democracy. Oh, that was a big show. <laughs> That's about all I got tonight. Um, I appreciate Killer Matt coming in here at the last minute. 
but I would suggest to any conservative, and if you know any, tell him not to vote for Donald Trump. Just leave it blank. Don't do it. You know he's a criminal. You know he's done wrong. You know that the things he says are lies. Just don't vote for him. That will get the, the message across. That will get the point to the RNC. Hey, stop letting these criminals run the show. And I think that would be... And then you could still vote for your governor and your senator and all that fun stuff. That's my plan to them. So if uh, if I talk to any conservative, I'll just tell them, don't, don't fill it out for him. You've been watching passively. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. <laughs> And that is it for me tonight. Uh, today is Thursday, so what I'm going to do is I'll chop this up. I'll uh, edit out all the the misspeaks and the the and and the the dead space and all that fun stuff, and I will turn this into a YouTube video tomorrow. Publish it on the YouTube channel, which you can see here. If you want to see any more of my old videos, you can go there to the YouTube channel. Um, smash the like, smash the subscribe button, break the thumbs up button, fondle the bell and stab someone in the comment section. It's a violent place. YouTube, it's a violent place. Be careful when you go there. Then I will be back on Saturday morning, maybe Friday morning for a dwarf stream. I like dwarf streams on Friday morning, but I might be busy. I'm not entirely sure. I'm probably disclosing too much information, but my state has ranked choice voting. For now, I put Kamala at the top, my favorite third parties in the middle, and then Trump at the bottom. Fantastic job. I love the idea of ranked choice voting. It is a good idea. I wish everyone had it. I want all the states to have it. I don't think it would remove the two-party system entirely, but it would give us alternatives. It would give us people who are trying to pick and choose the best from the left and the best from the right and run as a, a candidate who's closer to the center. I think that's a good thing. Ranked ranked choice is the way to go for the country. Get rid of the Electoral College. I'm on board. Get rid of the Electoral College. It's a part of the constitution right now, but we can create an amendment that gets rid of it. We have amendments. We have an amendment process. And honestly, if there's a giant blue wave with Kamala, it wouldn't surprise me if they did that. I think Kamala wins. She may or may not have the Senate. They could push to get rid of the Electoral College. It'd be difficult and would require a lot of work, but it's possible. That's all I've got for tonight. Uh, my voice is starting to give out. I'm not entirely sure why. I'm not sick. I don't think I used my throat all that often or said anything loud or screamed or anything like that. So I am a, uh, all done for that night. I appreciate everyone who's here. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, if you want to go to the Discord, you can leave links to other uh, news stories, and I will talk about them next time I come on. So if you go to the Discord, you leave a link to an important news story, I will read it, and I'll look at it. I'll put it up on the screen, and we can feel it all together on Saturday morning. It'll be interactive. It'll be a good time. And that is it for me tonight. Uh, I appreciate everybody who's here. Thank you very much. And I am about to knock off. Good night, throat goat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. I am the throat goat. It is true. Uh, maybe that's what it was. Is that, why, is that why this thing is working right? Is that why this thing is working right? All of a sudden, I'm RFK. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go before the left cancels me. All right. Goodbye. I am the algorithm. Click on this video to make me happy. You wouldn't like me when I am angry.